Hello, welcome to Energy 154, Unit 3. In this unit, we're going to discuss wind energy. So like many times, we, where we start is with the energy makeup of the United States. But what I want you to do for homework is, if we look at wind's contribution to the energy mix, it doesn't look very, like a very big contribution. Now again, this is for 2011. So what I want you guys to calculate for homework is... What's the percentage that wind provides of the total United States energy supply? So that'll be one of your homework questions, so make sure you calculate that. So before we talk really about how wind can generate electricity, it helps the list to learn a little bit about um, where, why wind even blows or where does it come from. Okay, so that's what we're going to start with. So the big picture idea is um, that wind comes from pressure or pressure differences or temperature differences. So if we look at um, the net radiation that hits the Earth, this is probably not surprising. But the most radiation, this is in watts per meter squared, the most radiation hits right around the equator. And the least radiation hits around the poles. So what happens is when you create a temperature difference, you also create a pressure difference. And so air wants to move to... Um, balance out those temperature and pressure differences. And when air is moving, that's what we call wind. So that's the basic idea behind wind, is that the Earth's surface it does not all receive the same um, solar radiation. And so wind is trying to balance that solar radiation out. So just we're just going to talk about three um, large wind mechanisms in this course. One's going to be a Hadley cell. The second's going to be monsoons. And the third is going to be Walker circulation. You've probably heard about monsoons before, but I don't, it's Hadley cell and Walker circulation are less um, typical. So this is a picture of a Hadley cell. Um, and what's happening here is that we can see the warm, moist air is from the equator. And then it goes, it, it rises, and it circulates around to the cool, dry air this is right around 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south latitude. So you can see this circulation is bringing warm air from the equator um, to 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south and cool air back to the equator. So again, it's trying to balance out that heat. So that's the whole idea from, of major wind systems. So the second one we're going to talk about is a monsoon. So a monsoon is different in summer and winter. So this is sort of a picture of what's going on in summer and what's going on in winter. Sometimes monsoons can be called rainy seasons or whatnot. They really have to do with more localized climate than the Hadley cell. So if we look at a land mass um, with, in the summer, the land is hotter than the ocean. So if the land is hotter than the ocean, we're again going to get this circulation loop and water is going to be drawn in from the ocean to the land. And that's the basic idea is in these type of situations, water is drawn into, from the ocean to the land. And that's because of the heat imbalance of the land and the water. And what that does is it makes it rainy during um, this season. What happens a lot more is if, if we have this mountain here near the water, it really amplifies this effect. Because the wind, because when it rises here because of the mountain, the rain falls. And then if we look in the winter, the opposite happens. So again, the land is colder and the ocean's warmer, so we get the circulation that goes around this way. So in a um, counterclockwise fashion. And then it rains more out to sea, and that's basically the dry season. So this is sort of a um, weather pattern you'll see locally in some places. But it also makes the wind drive here very predictably. So there's another thing, it's called a walker circulation. And th these are... Um, sort of what makes some trade winds in the Pacific. So again, we have, what turns out is there's more, um, there's, there's wet, hot air here, because we get more solar radiation here. And so it rises, and then it falls and sinks as it cools over here, and then it's a circulation this way. So it's a little different way to look at this circulation pattern, but it's another circulation pattern. So then we also have very localized weather patterns where we have high pressure systems and low pressure systems. And in the high pressure system, you can see the lines of equal pressure 
are pretty far away from each other, so that means it's not as windy. But in a low pressure system, the lines of equal pressure are very close by. So what that means is that it'll be much more windy because we have bigger pressure differences over a shorter range. So that's why low pressure systems, um, you'll, you'll see that it's much more windy when a low pressure system comes by. So now we know where the wind comes from, we could talk about how a wind turbine generates electricity. So in a, in a conventional power plant, what we see is we have some sort of heat, and that usually comes in the form of fossil fuels like coal or natural gas, or sometimes in the form of nuclear reactions, but heat nonetheless. And that heats up water, which turns to steam, which drives a turbine, which turns a generator. And all a generator is, is a magnet spinning inside coils of wire. And when you have a magnet spinning inside coils of wire, it makes electricity. So as long as we can get that magnet to spin inside those coils of wire, we can create electricity. So what a wind turbine does is what's sort of nice is it combines the turbine and generator on top of a tower. And the turbine is the wind turbine blades. And the generator is in the back of the wind turbine, what's called in a cell. And we'll see the components of the wind turbine in the next slide. But this is a much simpler system than a regular power plant. So it's very nice and elegant that it gets rid of that heat and water step. So we don't, we don't have any of that in our power plant. So it's a simpler power plant. So if we look at inside the wind turbine, here's the components of a typical turbine. And if we look at the left picture, first we can see the blades, we can see the hub, which sometimes we refer to um, when we're talking about wind speeds at hub heights. So that's an important thing to remember is the hub is right here. We also look at the nacelle. The nacelle is usually without the um, rotor blades. It's usually this whole top portion, so it includes the hub. Then we have a tower that holds it up. So if we look inside the nacelle, we can see we have a rotor hub, and that's connected to a shaft, which is this is low speed, and then a gearbox um, converts it to high speed, and then the generator is right here. So that's sort of where the generator and, and turbine is inside a wind turbine. If you want an alternate picture, you can see the picture on the right here. So wind turbines have had lots of growth throughout the years. You can see on the um, y-axis, this is rotor diameter. And on the x-axis, we have years brought into service and then number of megawatts. So we've increased since 1985 from 0 0.05 megawatts in, in, just over, um, in just 20 years to 5 megawatts. So that's a 100-fold improvement of, of power. So there are designs um, out there that, um, and if you want to do a little research, you might find that you, you, there are some bigger wind turbines in operation now because this was back in 05. But the 8 to 10 megawatt range is where the cutting edge is now. And to get an idea of how big these wind turbines really are, you can see on the same picture the wingspan of an Airbus A380, which is a big jet plane. And so that's the, that's the plane, how it would look compared to one of these wind turbines. So these are massive machines, and if you ever get a chance to see one, I highly recommend it. So we've learned a little bit about where the wind comes from and also sort of how a wind turbine works. So now we're really going to go over how we calculate wind turbine output. And there's basically five major steps to this. So what we're going to see is these five steps. So the first step is figuring out how tall our wind turbine is. The second step is figuring out how fast the wind is blowing at our wind, at our wind turbine height. And then we're going to use um, a specific wind turbine and it's called power curve to estimate the power production of our wind turbine. And then steps four and five are figuring out from that power what's the energy. And we're going to learn what capacity factor is and how to calculate it for a given wind turbine. So the first step is to figure out how tall our wind turbine is. So for this example, what we're going to run through is a turbine that was installed at the University of Delaware Lewis campus. And it's a two megawatt Gamesa G90 wind turbine. So we can see these are the specs of the turbine. So there's lots of different specs here, but what we're really worried about is the tubular tower specs here. So if we zoom in on that and look a little bit more, we can see that there's different types. So you can, have, you can buy this wind turbine at different heights and sections. So three sections gives you 67 meters, four sections gives you 78 meters, and five sections gives you 100 meters. So it turns out they installed at UD the four section height. So it's 78 meters tall. 
So that's our height. So now we want to use the wind speed variation with height to determine the wind speed at the height of the wind turbine. So first off, let's, let's take a look at how we can measure the wind. So what we have here is we have some different weather stations. So this is a picture of a tower with, with what's called an anemometer on the top of it. And this is sort of a blown up view of an anemometer right here in the middle picture on the right side of it. So it's called a cup anemometer. So the faster those cups move, the faster the wind is blowing. And then we can figure out what direction it's coming from from this wind vane. Okay. The problem is, is that our wind turbine is 78 meters tall, and this may only be 5 or 10 meters tall. And we all know that as you get higher in height, the wind speed's going to go up. And if you think about it, we know from flying a kite that this is true. Once we get the kite above a first certain height, it stays up much more easily. Okay? So if we go back, if we look at this, how do we go from our, say, 10 meter or 5 meter measurement height, so we know how fast the wind is blowing down here, how do we figure out how fast it's going to blow at the top of our wind turbine, so that, or the height of a kite? So here's the general picture you can think about how you do this. Um, first off, what we want to define is a few things. We want to define Z sub R as the height of our measuring device. So you can think about it as Z reference. So that's going to be generally lower than the wind turbine. And then we're going to have Z is the hub height of our wind turbine. So remember I said the hub was right in the middle here? So, so those are two things we, we, we already know, or we should already know. If we know how tall our measurement device is and know how tall our wind turbine is. What's nice is there's several equations that um, can give us approximations as to if we know the wind speed here, how high it is up here. What we're going to use is this wind speed variation with height equation. And this, this is from um, Wind Energy Explained. So this is a sort of manual for the wind industry. So what we really want to know is V, which is the velocity of um, the wind at the wind turbine hub height. So if we have VR, which is the measured wind speed at the reference height, if we have Z, which again is the height above the ground, which is the height of our wind turbine hub height, Z0 is what we'll talk about a little bit more. It's a surface roughness length, but the idea behind it is that wind is going to be different if you have a lot of trees around, say, than if you just have a plain field, and that Z0 is what takes that into account, and we'll talk more about that. ZR we talked about in the last slide, and that is the reference height, so that's where your um, measuring um, height is, so of your anemometer. And then, again, we have Z0, which is our roughness height roughness length. So let's go um, on and figure out what the roughness length is. So I apologize, this is a little grainy picture. Again, it's taken from the Wind Energy Explained book. But the idea is that the rougher your surface, the higher you're going to have as a roughness length. Okay. So this roughness length is in millimeters. So if we have very smooth ice or mud, the roughness length is very small. And it goes up very to an actual center of cities with small buildings. We can see that we have a very large roughness length. So this is the idea: is that this is going to change a few things um, when we change the roughness length. So what we're going to do next is I'm going to this equation is not an easy equation to think about. So what I made for um, this class was I made um, what's called a computable document format. So again, you need the CDF player if you haven't already installed it. And you're going to want to download the wind speed at varying heights CDF from Blackboard. So you'll see a few things here. Um, what I want you to do is go through this exercise, read these, these problems, and I want you to change several of these values and notice how the graph changes. And then for homework, you're going to have to answer the following questions. So you can read those questions and answer it. But the idea is you'll see how wind speed really does vary with height. And then you'll see how to go ahead and calculate um, the wind speed at varying heights using, using that equation. So now that we know how to calculate the wind speed at different heights, we want to know how much power is in that wind. So what we can do is use the power and wind equation. So we can see that the power 
is in watts per meter squared. This rho, which is that Greek letter, is the density of air, which is 1.3 kilograms per cubic meter. A is the swept area of the turbine in, in cubic meters. And what that means is the swept area of the turbine is, if you were to draw a circle around the um, where the blades move and take the area of that. And then V is the velocity or wind speed in meters per second at hub height. So again, remember that hub is right in the middle of the um, blades in the wind turbine. So we can um, we can do, go through a few examples with this, but again, what I want to do is I want you to get a feel for the, how this equation works. And I want you to go ahead and do the same thing you did last time with the wind variation and height, and download the speed at varying heights um, computable, computable document file. So, and follow the directions here, and you're going to have to answer these questions for homework. So now that we've sort of gone through steps one and two, and we've now we figured out the power in the wind, that's the power input to the system. The power output of the system is the electricity that comes out of the turbine. So if we remember um, that things can never be 100% efficient, our electricity production is going to be less than the power in the wind. And how we're going to estimate that power production is through the wind turbine um, power curve. And this is the power curve for the G90, so the Gamesa G90 that's um, on site at uh, the University of Delaware. And we can see a couple different things from this power curve. But the first thing I want to mention is the cut-in speed. So cut-in speed, 3 meters per second. What that means is if the speed is less than 3 meters a second, the wind turbine won't generate any electricity at all. And the cut-out speed is 21 meters per second. So what that means is if the wind speed is higher than 21 meters per second, the brakes will come on in the wind turbine, and the wind turbine won't generate anything at all. Now, this is because we don't want our wind blades, our wind turbine to break by spinning too fast or the wind to blow over the tower. So that's why it doesn't produce at that, um, that high of speed. And then we can see it in graphical format that it goes up slightly. We have the power in kilowatts on the y-axis. goes up slightly, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And then it really starts going up um, from like 7 to 11. And then it levels off. So um, as the wind speed grows a above 12, the power output doesn't grow that much. And this is just because even though there's more power in the wind, the generator can't generate any more than the maximum here. And this is the same data in tabular, for, tabular format here. So um, if we look, how much power in kilowatts would be generated if the wind blew at 11 meters per second at the hub of the turbine? So if it was blowing at 11 meters per second, we see right here, the speed's 11 meters per second, so it would be generating 1,863 kilowatts. So for, for homework, I want you to answer the question, how much power in kilowatts would be generated if the wind blew at 6 meters per second at the hub of the turbine? So now let's look how efficient this conversion is. So if we look at the efficiency of um, a turbine, what really we want to do is efficiency always equals output over input. And we know the input to a wind turbine is the power of the wind. Oops. Is the power of the wind, which is right here. And the output is the power of the turbine. So that's how we can get the conversion efficiency. So we can see that the efficiency varies quite drastically. Sometimes it's 10%, and sometimes it's almost 45% or more than 45%. So this is because just because some turbines work well at some conditions and others work well at other conditions. So as part of your homework, you're going to have to describe in words and in formulas how the last three columns of the chart were calculated. So how these three columns were calculated from the speed um, from the first column. So that will be one of your homework questions. Okay, so now we sort of estimated the power production of the wind turbine. So what we're going to do now is we need to get energy. And to get energy, we multiply the power by the time period. And we'll go over how to calculate for multiple time periods. But let's just say we were um, producing at 11 meters per second. We're, so we're producing 1,863 kilowatts. 
if that was blowing at 11 meters a second for 24 hours, how how many kilowatt hours would we generate? Well, we just take the 1863 kilowatts times 24 hours, and we get 44,712 kilowatt hours. So that's a pretty easy problem. So the next step is we want to get capacity factor. So capacity factor is um, the percentage of energy that you generated compared to how much you could generate if you were if the turbine was producing at its maximum power the whole time. So that's a little bit wordy, but basically what you do is you take the energy produced during a time period, so in our case we just figured it out for 24 hours, and divide by the amount of energy the turbine would have produced if it output full power at all times. So let's take a look at what that looks like, because an example really helps illuminate this. So again, this is our problem from the last time. We got 44,712 kilowatt hours. Let's calculate the capacity factor during that 24-hour period. The full power energy output, well, our full power energy output here is 2,000 kilowatts. We can see that from the table or from, we know it's a 2 megawatt turbine, but so we know 2,000 kilowatts times 24 hours. We would have produced, if we were producing at full output, 48,000 kilowatt hours. So if we look at the capacity factor here, we have actual energy output on the top. So that was what we measured which was the 44,000, over full power energy output, 48,000, times 100%, we get 93.2% as our capacity factor. And this is just for that one 24-hour period. So what if we have a table like this, where we have this wind speed at hub height, so we have all these l different wind speeds, and then we also have different hours of occurrences for each year, or for each um, wind speed. So if we have this, we're going to have to do this demo in Excel, which we'll do now. So to start this problem, what we really have to think about is, first, what the power of the turbine is going to be at all of those wind speeds. So the first thing we want to do is go back to our um, table here, and we're going to input this table for all the wind speeds into Excel. So for example, at 6 meters a second, the power is going to be 363.8. So I've done this already in Excel, so let me bring that up for you. So again, at 6 meters a second, the turbine power up was 363.8. And then if we look at, let's just say, 8 meters a second, just to make sure I've done this right, it should be 900.8. So there we go. So what we're going to do now is, again, I've had all this in Excel now, the wind speed at hub height the hours of occurrence per year, and the turbine power output here. So those are all we, all, we have them now. So remember, if we want the turbine energy output, we multiply the kilowatts by the hours. So in Excel, we do equals cell B2 times tell cell C2. Now again, as you know, what's really nice about Excel is to replicate this formula, we can just drag all the way down. So these are our turbine energy outputs for the whole year, so kilowatt hours. So to get the actual energy output for the whole year, we're going to sum those kilowatt hours because our turbine's producing that many total kilowatt hours that year. So that's our total kilowatt hours that this turbine would produce per year if these were the hours of occurrence. So to get the capacity factor, we have to remember we have to divide this total energy output, so the actual total energy output, by the max turbine output in, one, in a single year. So what we're going to do is for the max turbine output, we have to remember that our max output is 2,000 kilowatts. We type in 2,000. And then we have to know that there, we want to sum the total hours of occurrence. Okay. So if we, if we look at that sum, so if we just type in the sum here, just to look at how many hours of occurrence have occurred in a year. A typical, if we do 365 times 24, there's 8,760 hours in one year. So that's a good number to remember. Um, whenever you're doing energy calculations over a full year, the good number to remember is 8,760 hours per year. So the max turbine output in a year is this much. And we have the turbine energy output. Let's make this a little bit easier to see by putting commas in here. So we can see that this one is about 8 million, or 8.9 million, 
and this is about 17.6 million. So let's calculate the capacity factor. So remember, we take the actual, which is this 8.9 million, and we divide by the max turbine output in one year. We hit enter. Now, we can always report it as a decimal, but Excel also will, you can put things in percentages just to see it a little better. So the capacity factor for this um, turbine under these conditions is 51%. So that's how you do this in Excel. So what I want you to do for um, homework is if here we're given the wind speed at hub height, what would change in your analysis if this was the wind speed um, at a reference height of 10 meters? What additional calculation would you have to do? And you can just answer that in words in your homework. OK, so now the next thing is, I just gave you the hours of occurrence per year. And I and I said that that occurred at a certain wind speed. But how would we get that those hours of occurrence? And and how would we get that for a certain location? And that's what we'll discuss next. So let's see how we could what are some examples of data that we could get this hours of occurrence per year. So there's something called typical meteorological year files. So these are um, files that are compiled um, by the national government. And they give a typical year's worth of data for many weather variables for every hour. So that includes wind speed, which is what we're interested in. But we'll see later they also include solar radiation data and temperature um, and, and many other things that are really um, helpful for any um, person studying energy. And these full files can be found for uh, many different cities across the US and abroad. Um, at this website. So we're not going to go there, but for, for this, the intent of this presentation and for um, your, uh, one of your projects is we're going to use to compare two different sets of data. We're going to compare Wilmington with um, Cold Bay, Alaska. So Wilmington, Delaware, again, where I'm from, with Cold Bay, Alaska. And so what we have is the wind speed on the y-axis and the hours of the year. Remember, there's 8,760 hours in a year, so that's where this data ends. And as we expect, Cold Bay, Alaska is much more windy than Wilmington, Delaware. So what we can do here is we can say, okay, let's just look at certain um, wind speed ranges and see how many hours of occurrence appears during this year. And what we can do is we call that bin data. So another way to look at sort of the, the data on the slide before is a table like this. So if we look here on the left, the wind speed in miles per hour of Wilmington, the hours of occurrence per year are much more for the 0 and 5 range than in Cold Bay, Alaska. And that just means it's less windy. It's, we have much more periods of time where it's less windy. We can also see the 35 to 40 miles per hour range in Cold Bay appear a lot more than in Wilmington. So that's the basic idea is that the bin data here um, can give you a very concise table for 8,760 hours of data. And it's very nice to, to view it that way. We can also sometimes we, we view bin data as, um, as graphs, and we'll show you that in the next slide. And as we're looking at this stuff, what I want you to do is, for homework, I want you to type in your own words what bin data is. So again, this is just sort of graphed a little bit differently. The wind speed in miles per hour is on the x-axis, and then on the y-axis is wind speed. The left is Wilmington, and the right is Cold Bay. So on the left, again, we see towards the, the bigger bars towards the lower wind speeds. And, and that's because Wilmington isn't as windy as Alaska. In Alaska, we see a more spread out distribution of bars and more shifted to the higher wind speeds. So again, that's because it's very windy. So the next thing we're going to talk about is now that we know all this, all this stuff about wind turbine power production, for our project for, for um, calculating how much wind poten potential a state has, we really have to figure out how to calculate this power production for a state. So that's what we're going to talk about now. So to calculate the wind power production for a state, we're going to do a couple different steps. So I'm going to go over step one because it's the hardest step. And I'm going to leave step two and three as an exercise for you. 
So step one is to calculate the wind power per unit area in watts per meter squared. So this is the actual land area that a total wind farm will take up. So the meter squared in this case is the actual land area, so acres or, or whatever, property. The meter squared in our wind power, so don't get confused, because the meter squared in our wind power equation is the meter squared of the swept area of the turbine. Remember, the whole area, if you draw a circle around where the blades rotate. So don't get confused between these two units. Okay? And if we can, um, then we're going to calculate the area per person of the state, and then we're going to assume a, the percent of the state is covered with wind farms. And I'll leave it up to you as an exercise is to figure out, once we have these three things, how to calculate the kilowatt hours per person per day for wind production. Okay, so again, remember this wind power equation. This area is a swept area of the wind turbine. So the first thing we're going to do is put this into a diameter of the turbine. So if we do that, remember, if we remember that area equals pi times the radius squared, in this case, pi is here, and the radius is the diameter of the wind turbine over 2, and then we square it. So that's what's going on. Remember, pi r squared. And remember, the radius is diameter over 2. So that's what's going on here. So you'll see why I did this in the next couple slides. So that's the basic idea. So now we're just converting this area into a di the diameter of the wind turbine. So what we want to do is this is the, now we know that this is the power in watts for one turbine. So this is the power in watts for one turbine. So if we divide by the area that one turbine takes up, we can get the watts per meter squared. So what there's a rule of thumb when you're spacing wind turbines. So you can see that this is like a you know picture or of a of a wind farm. There's a wind turbine here, and we don't want to replace our wind turbines too close together because um, we want the wind to start blowing faster by the time it gets to the next turbine. So if we put them too close together, we'll get lots of turbulence effects and won't get the full power output that we could. So a rule of thumb in spacing is that we want to space wind turbines five times the diameter. So the area of this of this spacing is 5d squared, because one side of this box is 5d, and the other side of the box is 5d. So what we're going to do is use this. So if we want to look for the unit land area, we take the power output of one wind turbine, which is up here, and divide by how much um, area that one wind turbine takes up. So that's the idea. So, um, so what we're going to do is when we do that, we're going to do a little bit of algebra. And what happens is that d's cancel out here. And then if we combine the 2 times the 2 squared times the 5 on the bottom, we get the 200. And then the rho and v cubed stay the same. So right here, this is the watts per square meter of land area of the wind blowing over that land area. So again, this is the input to all of our turbines. So this is the watts per square meter of the input to all of our turbines. So what we need to take into account is that to get the power coming out of the wind turbine, we have to multiply by the efficiency of the wind turbine. So the efficiency in this case of uh, what we're going to assume is that our wind turbines are 50% efficient or one half. So we multiply by this, which again is the power of the wind blowing over a certain land area. When we multiply that by one half, we get this equation here. So this is the equation you're going to want to use when you're doing your project of the wind potential for your state. So now that we have this equation, we need to put in one variable here. And that's the velocity. So the velocity right here. So what we're going to do is look at some wind maps to get this velocity. So this is a, a very nice picture um, put out by NREL. NREL makes a lot of these maps. And if you want um, more of these maps, you can go to this website down below here.
But the idea is that it's a color-coded map, and it sort of makes sense, is that the very windy regions are the plains in the middle of the country. And then other parts are spotty. So here in the Rockies, where it's high, there's some windy places. And then measly old Delaware is not very windy here. Um, and there's some, some places in um, around the Great Lakes and in the Appalachian Mountains that are also windy and along the coastlines. So that's the idea. And then the wind speeds in meters per second are color-coded over here. So, so you can see that right there from the idea. And this says in-video question, but really what it means is homework question. So um, this is one of the questions you'll have to answer for homework. So again, here's a sort of zoomed in picture. You can see um, now it's just Delaware. Um, and there's plenty of maps for every state here. So if you're interested in your particular state, you can go to this website. Um, but again, Delaware is not very windy. But one nice thing too is that some states that you pick are going to have an offshore component. So this is the same thing, same sort of map, except now this is all offshore. And this is what's nice about offshore is that it can be a lot more windy offshore than it can be onshore. Um, so we can see here's here's all the wind for the for those uh, locations. And the same thing here. Here's the wind um, offshore for Delaware. So again, you're going to take these measurements of wind speeds and put it into the wind power equation and um, you can go from there to figure out how many watts per square meter you can get from a wind farm in a certain area of your state. So for the discussion board for this is a lot of times we can there's windy places and we could place wind turbines but a lot of times they're hard to cite because no one wants the wind turbine near them and sometimes it's legitimate reasons and sometimes it's called NIMBY, or not in my backyard. So why do you think this is the case? Why do you think people don't want wind turbines in this backyard? And how do you think this problem could be addressed? So again, we have our unit three check sheet at the very end. Um, this was a long unit, and the homework's gonna be difficult. So um, we have unit three homework, the discussion board, with one original post and three replies. And you can also read chapter 410 and B from the textbook.